is I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions, and then I'm going to open it up to you audience members, and then we're going to close it. So how do you guys feel? Are you guys feeling good? Yeah? Very good. Very good? Awesome. Well, congratulations on being here and having your film screened at Rain Dance. Uh, my first question to you guys is, how, how was it? You know, this entire movie was made out of cell phone calls, and I want to know from the actor's perspective as well as from the director's perspective what kind of challenges you faced and how you overcame them. It was different, not having anybody face-to-face -to, -face to work with, but um, I felt that that had a sense of realism that, that I really appreciated about, I, I mean, I've had personal, intimate phone conversations in the past, and so I, I felt that it was, it was important and it, it, it added something. It, but it's definitely different, it was an adjustment yeah, and even though the actor that you're acting opposite, um, sorry, uh, wasn't there face to face with you, almost all of the time that was the person on the other end of the phone call. So you were usually acting with your partner, but without them there, which really did lend to that like, realism, you were actually having that conversation. So. Which was Gia's decision. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the script, because it's very obviously very dialogue driven, could you give me a taste of what it was like script wise, writing it, and how long it took? Absolutely. The movie was conceived uh, several years ago, and um, it all started when I turned 21 years old. Because when I turned 21, I knew that I had finally become an adult. And I don't mean that I knew I was an adult because I'd reached a legal drinking age which in America is 21, uh, or that it had anything to do with the number itself, it was because for the first time in my life, I had grown an adult toenail. It was kind of yellow and flat, and it had that repulsive thickness that adult toenails get. It scared the hell out of me. I really didn't think that was gonna happen. I'd always associate them with older relatives of mine, you know, who chain smoke and wear sandals. Did you see them on the beach? It's disgusting. Yeah. Really, really disgusting people. Anyway, so I saw this toenail and I thought to myself, time to make something substantial. And uh, this, was, uh, this was back when I was making a, a living through online classifieds. And uh, it was a great period in my life. I just kind of figured out the machinery of my city. I felt big as industry, and there's this little girl who used to follow me around back then, this little 18 year old belly dancer. She didn't mind the toenail. In fact, I think for her, it probably represented a kind of stark reality she was drawn to. A lot of young girls are like that, I think. You know what I mean? Death instinct. And so, uh, she would accompany me when I would commute to objects of interest. That's how I made a living. And we'd hop light rail trains together in the rain late at night. We'd be among all the most eminent figures of the night, the, the tired pushers sinking in their seats, staring catatonic out the window at all the flashes of neon going by, uh, the emaciated poor staggering down the aisles, kitchen knives glinting in their back pockets, muttering how no one jumps their cousin and gets away with it. Uh, a lot of them spitting right on the train. Some of them whistling, and whistling really well, too. Nobody whistles like the poor. The rich, they'll never have that. And, uh, and so we'd be among this atmosphere, we'd be inside this atmosphere doing our part. And there was a point at which I began to recite lines to the girl, my friend, I began to speak lines of conversation. Um, and she would write them down in her phone. She'd type them with her tiny thumbs into this endless stream of text message drafts. And this was at a point where I was very preoccupied with the commission, which we can get into later, um, which will elucidate some of that. But I was preoccupied with, some, with a commission that involved writing. And so um, we'd go on this train, she'd write them down in her phone, and eventually, these words became the words that the people in the movie committed to memory. Uh, and the people speaking those words became, after 
several years of Waking Nightmare, the movie that we scrutinize and adore. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the audience now to see if the audience has any questions for the creative team. Oh, wow. All right. Up there. And that regards the commission, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, back then, before I'd met the girl, before I'd, before I'd, I'd ever thought about making a movie, there was uh, a group that I was corresponding with, uh, whose name I can't specify, but whose purpose concerned a resistance against certain forms of wireless pollution in America and the world. And there was a man in this group, he was a kind of an official of the group, a leader, and he wrote to me uh, after reading something that I'd written, uh, a piece of short fiction that someone had sent him, which he was fond of. He wrote to me with an offer, which at the time was very advantageous, uh, you know, in my position. Um, and the offer he was making was in exchange for me writing a film, which I'd never done before, uh, in which several young characters, through their incessant use of cell phones and other forms of wireless communication develop malignant brain tumors and die. And there was, um, I, I'd never made a, a movie before, and so uh, I contemplated this, this is, this is, and so this eventually became uh, the commission that I would contemplate when I would, when I would uh, be on the light rail with my friend. But coincidentally, before the movie was written, before the lines were conceived and dictated into my friend's cell phone, the man himself died in a car crash. Uh, he was killed in a car. And even though I couldn't correspond with him, and his offer wasn't... I'd only received a very small portion of his offer up front, it continued to affect me. And uh, his offer continued to enhance my vision to uh, correct my posture. And I continued making the movie through its thousand preparations and plague, through its personal plague. The movie cost me everything I ever had whenever I had it. It cost me all my money and money to come. It cost me my belief in men. It cost me my respect for them. It cost me my health. It co I grew throughout the making. I lost 20 pounds making the movie and I had a visible abdomen. They're pronounced. Um, I, uh, I grew gaunt and dour. The movie's basically a, a record of my health's nadir, of every, of every, of all the begging and sweaty cajoling I did every malnourished hour to people who spoke to me with, as if they were descending sage repose. It, uh, it's a reminder of, of every time, every frantic phone call I made at two in the morning to a friend or neighbor pleading with them to call out of work the next day. And then getting off the phone and Megan and myself putting four oversized tote bags onto our shoulders and hopping on a light rail train to an all hours grocery store to buy the next day's food so that four hours later at 6 a.m. when we arrived to set, everyone could be disappointed that it was bagels again for breakfast. Um, yeah. And we have our sound recorders here, correct? Yes. I'm personally curious as to how the sound and music came out in this film, because I know that it was shot in black and white, yet the music was so modern. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I didn't have anything to do with the music. I recorded the dialogue, the oh, on set okay. dialogue. Was all these guys. Uh, one of you, maybe tell me? Um, I'll try. 
Um, <clears throat> what's up? Uh, this is Ray, by the way. Woo! Yeah, I'm Woo! Ray. Woo! <laughs> uh, the recording of this, the music, the music was actually, before I answer that, uh, uh, this woman here had a question about what, what we shot on. Um, we shot on uh, an iPhone uh, with an adapter to uh, take on all sorts of old lenses um, that I'm fond of and, and uh, no other cinematographers are. But um, in any case, regarding the music, we recorded over the course of uh, like four days in a warehouse um, with, a, with a frustrated musician. Um, and uh, and my frustration and Jay's frustration, and um, and that resulted in um, several recordings that, uh, to the dismay of the musician, didn't end up in the movie. And um, what did end up in the film uh, is a uh, is in fact what you heard. Thank you. And is there any last minute questions from the audience? <laughs> How much of that was uh, improvised, and how much of it, some of it was like really self-conscious in the script, but uh, other parts seemed kind of scattered. How much yeah, the, the film was almost entirely improvised. Um, my actors are strangely attached to assonance. Uh, I see your movie is a lot about different ideas. Ideas on ideas on ideas, but what is the main idea that you want the audience to get from your movie? I think that we made this movie out of violence. Um, I want to, uh, I wanted to brandish our youth, and I wanted to confront all of the pathological disenchantment that infested us. Um, all of the overweight men sinking into easy chairs, watching some easy movie with more remote controls than they have fat little fingers. Mm. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.